I'll turn with me again in God's Word to Matthew chapter 7, and we're looking particularly at verses 7 to 11. Have you ever given up on prayer? Have you ever seen anyone give up on prayer? Perhaps it's been the case that there's been an illness, whether in yourself or in someone that you love, and you've prayed for healing, and God hasn't healed. God hasn't answered that prayer, and you think, what's the point? Maybe it's a family member that you've prayed for for so long, and they've died. And you think, what's the point of praying? God hasn't answered Or maybe it's been a problem in your job, a persistent problem, and you've gone to God and you've prayed about that problem, and he hasn't removed that problem from you. It continues and continues and continues, and you think, what's the point of praying? Maybe it's a sin that you've struggled with, a temptation, and you've grown weary of asking God to, to stop you from sinning. You just keep giving in to it. Or maybe it's for someone that you love that's not saved and you've prayed and prayed for their conversion and still to this day they remain outside of the kingdom of heaven. You pray and there is silence. You pray and it's like the sky is iron. Your prayers simply are not penetrating through and you become discouraged and you say God is not listening. So what is the point? Isn't it the definition of insanity to do the same thing over and over again and to expect to get different results? And maybe you begin to question yourself and you say, am I not insane? Praying these same prayers, I'm not getting any different answer. So what's the point in doing it? And yet you wouldn't admit that. You wouldn't say that at a met grip, I don't think. Uh, Unless you really trust someone, you're not going to share that burden with them. Because we know the scripture says in Psalm 65 verse 2, O you who, who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. Or Psalm 116 verse 1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. God hears prayer. God answers prayer. That's the correct answer. So we can't admit then to the fact that we get discouraged in prayer. Or that we've given up. Today as we think about prayer. I want us to focus on praying for conversions. And praying about what we're proposing to try and wish on. I want us over these next few months. On the the Sabbath that we've set aside in afternoon. For prayer. I want to take uh, this theme of prayer. To think four sermons on prayer. And to challenge us about how we pray. Particularly about the lost, those that you want to see saved, how we pray about the community here in Airdrie round about us that's in darkness and desperately needs light, and how we pray about a new place, seeking to take the gospel and expand and go out to the ends of the earth. It is prayer that is undoubtedly needed. And yet, as we contemplate prayer, we may say, well, we've tried that before. And we've not seen the answer. Now I would challenge you there on that point to reconsider. We've prayed about things like this before and we have seen answers. Sometimes we can be very good at saying, well, there's not been answers. Maybe it's not been the answers that you've anticipated, but there have been answers. We have seen fruit and the Lord is blessing. But nevertheless, I think we could say, and I think this is fair to say, There have been, well, whether you want to say few answers rather than no answers, or whether you want to say the answers have been less than what was anticipated or less than what we've asked for. And therefore we think, well, I know we shouldn't give up, but I'm sorely tempted to give up. What are we to do as believers? Well, I want us to ask, why are, are there no answers or why are there few answers And to consider two things. First of all, am I asking amiss? Am I asking amiss? Or are we as a congregation asking amiss? Are we asking in the wrong way? Are we praying in the wrong way? Not all prayers are equal. 
The, the Bible teaches us that we can ask in the wrong way. In James chapter 4, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. A prayer that is just for yourself and for your own passions is not going to be something God is going to give you. So, for example, there could be two people who are praying for a new car. One is praying for a new car because their car is completely broken and they're struggling with their car and they can't get to the places they need to go to and they're finding it financially tight. And so they, they want the Lord to provide them with something they need. The second person could be praying for a new car just simply because they want a new model. They want a nicer car, a fancier car. Um, and they pray to God, give me a new car. Give me the finances for it. Which prayer is a good prayer? Isn't it obvious that that second person is praying to spend it on their own passions? It's for them. They've got a perfectly good car that they could be content with. This new car is not going to help them expand the kingdom of heaven. This new car is not going to, in any way, deepen their faith. It's not going to be a blessing to other people. And so they are simply praying to spend it on their own passions. That is not a righteous prayer. Or Psalm 66 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. Think about someone who has in their heart iniquity that they are not confessing. I think that's the idea of cherishing this iniquity. It's sin that they're holding on to in their heart. They're refusing to repent of it. They're refusing to allow Christ to have dominion in their heart. They're keeping this sin locked away there. I can keep sinning in this way. And yet they're coming to God and praying. Is God going to answer that prayer? God doesn't hear the prayer of those who are not penitent. That's a proud, arrogant attitude. It's not saying that you have to be perfect to be heard by God. But there has to be at least that basic, I don't want to sin. I want to be, uh, I want to be done with sin. That penitence, that contrite heart, broken over sin. I'm not where I should be, but Lord, I want to be where you would have me be. Cherishing iniquity is one reason why God does not answer prayer. Or think about Judges chapter 10, where the people come to God in a time of suffering. Isn't that the pattern of Judges? They sin, they face the suffering as God allows enemies to invade them, and so then they cry out to God in mercy. And although sometimes God allows them to go through that pattern of sin, misery, cry out for mercy and then salvation. He doesn't always do that because he knows that sometimes their cries for mercy are not real, true cries for mercy. And so in this occasion in Judges 10, God's answer to them as they're pleading with him to save them and deliver them, he simply says this, go and cry to the gods whom you have chosen. Let, let, let them save you in this time of your distress. Go to these idols and see what they can do. Sometimes God rejects our prayers because we're still holding on to idols. We're only seeking him in a time of trouble. We're only seeking him because something's gone wrong in our life. We haven't been seeking him at any other time. And God says, well, go to your idols. You've had that idol of self, self-sufficiency. You've been going on about your life, just thinking that you can manage by yourself. Well, let's see how well you do. And sometimes God does that. Sometimes God does that to the Christian. He allows us to, to just, he doesn't come in and just solve your problems like that, which he could do. But he says, well, let's see how it goes. And the appropriate response to that, of course, would be that God's people would humble themselves and confess, yes, we have been wrong to have these idols. Yes, we've been wrong to be self-sufficient self-dependent we have we are totally in the wrong we see that now please don't abandon us please don't leave us to ourselves that's the worst possible thing we could have to have no god beside us so please forgive us and please return to us as we return to you that's the appropriate response and of course in the time period of the judges that wasn't always how god's people responded 
So there are definitely, according to the Bible, times in which God does not answer prayer. But here in the verses we have, verses 7 to 11 of chapter 7, it's a different reason that we we come to consider. It's not some secret sin cherished in the heart, but rather it's an encouragement here to fervency and intensity and earnestness in prayer. Sometimes the reason why our prayers are not answered is because we're not being fervent in prayer. And we see that here, (coughs) excuse me, we see that here in what we're counseled to do. Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. And there's a progression here, isn't there? To ask is one thing. To seek is more intense and more earnest. And then to knock is uh, to the most, to the the extreme level of intensity. These three words, they're imperatives. That means they're commands. They're things that we should do. Ask, seek, knock. Uh, But they are um, a special type of imperative in the Greek. It's not that you just ask once and then you're done. That you seek once and then you're done. That you knock once and you're done. The the type of imperative that these are, there's a continuity in it. You ask and you keep asking. You seek and you keep seeking. You knock and you keep knocking. You don't give up at the first hurdle. Sometimes we go to a door and we knock the door, ring the doorbell or whatever we do. No one comes, off we go. But the idea here is you bang and you bang and you bang at the door. Until you get the answer. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks. It will be opened. Friends. I want you to think about your prayer life. And I want you also to think about the prayer life in this congregation. And I want you to ask yourself. Are we asking. But not seeking. Or or are we asking and seeking. But not knocking. Are we just engaging at a low level of prayer, a low intensity, a low fervency, a low earnestness? Could we go up a step? To ask implies that we have a need. You don't ask for help unless you need help. To ask shows that we recognize that we're bereft of something. There's a blessing that we need. And it also it has this idea of faith in it. You ask someone that you know can help you. And so in prayer, we ask God, because we know that God as creator, as the God of providence, as our redeemer, we know that he can do all things. We know that he's powerful. We know that he is willing and able to save. So when we think of the lost, we recognize that we have a need. We recognize that there are people that we want to see saved. We recognize we have a town all around us where there's darkness and death. And so we want to see that reversed. We want to see God pour out his spirit to revive, to refresh. We have a need, and so we go to God and ask. Because we recognize that God is the only one who can meet this need. Isn't that that not why we pray to God? He is able to save. He is able to save. Do you believe that? Therefore we pray to him. Of course, this applies to anything, not just to salvation, but that's where I'm focusing. You may go away from this sermon and think about another area that you're praying to God about, and that's good as well. But we're focusing particularly on this. But friends, we don't just ask. We should go on to seek. Not just to pray once and forget about it, or to pray a few times, or even just to pray regularly. Let us seek the thing that we are praying for. Seeking is more earnest, isn't it? Seeking is recognizing that the blessing is hidden away. Or that God himself has hidden his face from us. uh, As we've sung in some of our psalms. Where, Where God seems hidden from us, we need to go out and seek him. I know the children like to play hide and seek. In order to find the person who's hiding, you can't just sit there and say, well, I don't know where they are. 
You have to actually move, don't you? You have to go and find them. You have to look in every single nook and cranny until you find where they are. And so it is with prayer. We don't just pray. We pray and look. The psalmist talked about it there. Uh, Was it Psalm 142? Was it the eyes growing dim? Maybe that was one of the other ones. His eyes are growing dim because he's looking to God. And he's... He's eager for the answer to his prayer, but it's not coming yet. But he believes it will come, so he's straining his eyes. He's seeking. He's looking. That's what this has. Faith looks for the answers. It's not enough just to pray to God with faith because you believe he can do something. We must go further and pray to God with faith, looking for the answers. And that looking is active, not passive. I think all too often we're passive. We pray and then we forget we've prayed. And when God answers the prayer, we're just like, oh, right, okay, that's it. But faith looks for the answering of prayer. Are there any signs that God is already working? Are there any signs that God is already answering this prayer? Are there any evidences that God is moving? Are there any signs that the Spirit is being given? Are there any encouragements that God is hearing us and therefore we're to keep praying asking and seeking that's what it involves faith doesn't just ask because god is able to answer faith keeps pleading looking for the answer but then we move on to knocking and this is the greatest intensity isn't it this is not this is us not being content with waiting looking this is us saying to god i need this blessing And I need it now. And wasn't there that intensity in many of these psalms that we've been singing? I'm not going to just stand at this door and and keep asking. I am going to knock and knock and knock until you answer me. Until you come in mercy. Until you save. Because we know God desires salvation. We know that God is not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. We know that God is patient and long-suffering, not because he's disinterested, not because he's not just, but he's patient because he wants repentance. And so we will knock and knock and knock at heaven's door until we see salvation, conversions, and Christ building up the church. My friends, I want just to caution you. You can't do this with every single prayer. Go back to that example of the person that's praying for a brand new car because they want to spend it on their own passions. It's for them, for their sake and their sake alone. Prayer must be agreeable to God's will. And so I won't encourage you to knock at heaven's door for a blessing that's not agreeable to God's will. That's not the prayer we should continue with. But where we have a promise, where we have the encouragement in God's word to pray for these things, We must step up the intensity. If God isn't answering when we ask, and if God isn't answering when we seek, well then our duty is quite clear. We are to knock and we are to plead with him. We are to go deeper in our prayers. Perhaps, friends, in your own life, and I I can look at my own life, I think we all have lessons to learn here. Some of you maybe are asking and you haven't moved on to the seeking. Or some of you perhaps are seeking and not moving on to the knocking. So think about ourselves as individuals and as we think about ourselves as a congregation. Is it time for us to step up a gear? Is it time for us to really plead with God for these things? For the lost. We're coming up uh, soon to a mission. Uh, The GO team will be coming, God willing, at the end of March next month. And then we'll be having our, our annual mission services Do you want to see people saved? Of course you want to see people saved. We all want to see that. Well, let's ask. Let's seek. And let's knock. Let me give you some examples from the Bible. First of all, the ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was the expert at asking, seeking, and knocking. Hebrews 5 tells us that in the days of his flesh... Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Jesus wasn't someone that just gave a simple prayer at a prayer meeting and that was it. Jesus was someone that took himself off early in the morning, late at night, to pour out his heart. Loud cries and tears. Or think of the example of Jacob. Jacob um, wrestled with God, didn't he? He wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And we're told that Jacob said to him, I will not let you go until you bless me. There's an example of faith. Grappling with God in prayer. I won't let you go until you bless me. In Hosea 12 verse 4 it says about Jacob, He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. Or what about for you women, the example of Hannah in 1 Samuel. Hannah, of course, wanted a son. And what did she do? She went with bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She was knocking, wasn't she? She was knocking on the door of heaven. Or think about Elijah, the man of fervent prayer. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain And it did not rain. Isn't that right? That was his prayer. That there would be no rain. And there was no rain. And then later on he prayed that there would be rain. And he prayed seven times over for it, didn't he? He didn't just pray once and then say, well, there's no rain. He prayed and he sent his servant to look. He was seeking, wasn't he? He prayed again. Still nothing. Sent his servant, nothing. He prayed and he prayed and he sought and he sought Until he found it when he saw just the slightest evidence of God's answer, wasn't it? The little cloud. That's it. And there is where Elijah saw God is answering my prayer. He hasn't answered it yet fully. There's no rain coming down. It's still a drought. But I see there on the horizon this little cloud. God is faithful. And he is answering. Friends, do we want to see people saved? Let us follow these examples. These things are there for our instruction and our encouragement. Ask, seek, and knock. But the problem is for us is that we live in a fast world, don't we? You want food? Fast food comes quickly, doesn't it? You want something uh, to buy something? You don't have to get into the town and go find the shop and find exactly where it is on the shelves and decide, I want this one or that one. One click on Amazon and you can get it delivered and it can come that day to your door. We live in a world where if we don't have answers, we just type it into Google and up it pops and there we have it. That's the world we live in and we expect God to answer our prayers just like that. God doesn't answer our prayers like that. There are times that we need to ask, to seek and to knock. There are times where God says, I'm not going to give you what you want now. But I will later. And when we think of the conversion of the lost, when we think of the establishing of churches, these things are agreeable to God's will. Whether he does it now or not, that's for him to decide. But there's no reason for us to stop praying about these things. And so we shouldn't expect necessarily that God will give immediate answers. But we should expect an answer. You see the difference there? The difference between expecting an immediate answer And expecting an answer. Let us pray for these things. As a congregation let's pray for them. Remember that prayer of John Knox. Mary Queen of Scots was terrified. Not of the man himself. He wasn't a particularly tall man. She was terrified of his prayers. And one of Knox's prayers was this. Give me Scotland or I die. It was a prayer to the Lord to give him Scotland. To give him the nation. That it would be reformed according to the word of God, that people would be saved. Can't we pray the same thing in a sense? Give me Airdrie or I die. Give me Wishaw or I die. That intensity that we so long to see these times conformed to the will of God. Not just content to have a few people saved. That would be great. That would be an encouragement to us. But to see the whole time transformed, that sinners would be so converted that people would notice it. That it would make news. 
That people would say, they would marvel. Look at what's happening in this place. There is salvation. God is working. Friends, examine yourself. Are you praying amiss? Is there sin you're cherishing in your heart? Are you praying just for your own passions? Or is it a case not that there's sin, but that it's time to step it up a gear and to be more intense? But then the second thing I want to ask you, when we consider why there are so few answers to our prayers, is the problem with our view of God? Is our view of God a miss? Do we give up in prayer and we say, God has failed me, God has let me down? Or that God's not able to do these things. Or God doesn't want to do these things. Well look at how Jesus challenges us in verses 9 to 11. He uses this this example. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? See this example? There are some of you here who are fathers. Your son comes to you hungry. Can I have some bread? And you set down before them a stone. Chew on that. What, what, what an awful thing to do. It'd be the most wicked of fathers who would do that. I don't know any father that would do that. You know, there are fathers that are abusive in this world. Um, They may do things like that. But to think of a father, a a normal father that loves his son to do that. Or to give something harmful, a serpent instead of a fish. That is the, the definition of an evil father. There aren't many people like that. You who are evil, Jesus says, you who are relatively evil. It's not necessarily that you're completely evil, utterly evil. But you have sin. Yet you know better than that. You know how to give good gifts to your children. You know how to care and provide for those that you love. Well friends if even you can do it. If I can do that. How much more will our loving heavenly father do it? See it's it's an argument here from the lesser to the greater isn't it? If, If we can do it. Can't God who is perfectly loving. Can't he do it? And won't he do it? Look back at chapter 6, verse 30, as we read it earlier. All these worries that we have, will, will I have clothing? But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. God cares for grass. And he allows it to have little flowers. If he so cares for the grass that ultimately is worthless, will he not care for us, his children? And the ultimate demonstration of that love is seen in how the Lord sent his son into this world. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, we wonder, will God answer my prayer? Will God help me? Will he deliver me? Friends, you only have to look to Christ. Jesus came into this world because of love. Because of the love of God. The love for lost, unworthy, hell-deserving sinners. And yet God loved his people. He loved them so much. With an intense, fervent love. That he would not leave them in their sin. He would not leave them with their guilt. He would not leave them with the punishment they deserve in hell. No, instead he would send his own son to suffer and die in their place. That they could be reconciled to God. See, justice demanded blood. But love sent a substitute. Someone else's blood. So that we are saved. Friends, that's the ultimate demonstration of love. And when we pray and we're tempted to give up in prayer, and we're ever tempted to think God doesn't love me because he's not answering my prayers, we need to go back to the cross. How can we say God doesn't love us 
when we have the cross. God demonstrates his own love for us in that cross. In that cross, there is love. Friends, God is good. God knows how to give good gifts to his children. And more than that, God desires to give good gifts to his children. God isn't an abusive, neglectful father in heaven. It's not that he forgets us and we have to remind him. He's, oh, not these children again. Always demanding things from me. He wants to bless his people. He has eternal blessings for us. He has temporal blessings for us. And he delights in our prayers. He wants to hear our prayers. And he will answer our prayers. But friends, as we think of the goodness of God, that he won't give us a stone when we ask for bread, we do have to recognize that sometimes the way we define good is not the way God defines good. But, but we know that in the parent-child relationship, don't we? The child comes and asks for a sweetie. And in fact, the very thing they need is not a sweetie, but a, a, a spoonful of horrible tasting medicine. That's what they need because they've got some illness. The medicine is required, not a sweetie. And the child says, you don't love me because you're giving me this horrible tasting medicine. Friends, sometimes with God, we need to redefine what we consider to be good. Paul prayed to God about the thorn in his flesh, whatever that thorn in the flesh was. It was painful, it was suffering, it was horrible. He pleaded with God to take away that thorn in the flesh. And God said, no, you're going to keep that thorn in the flesh. But what was the good? Paul learned, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. He learned a better lesson. He learned what it was to trust in God. He learned what it was to depend upon God's grace. He learned what it was to trust in God's strength. And to even boast in his weaknesses. Friends, there are times when we pray about illness. And God doesn't take it away. Because that is the medicine that we need at that moment in time. The surgeon doesn't remove the cancer. Uh, just simply by rubbing on some nice smelling ointment he takes a scalpel and he makes the incision and there's blood and it's sore but it's done because it's for our good illness can be for our good the death of a loved one can be for our good the loss of all things can be for our good and we need to trust that our father in heaven knows what he's doing William Cooper who was a good friend of John Newton, suffered terribly from depression. He really suffered. And yet he wrote this hymn. We don't sing hymns, of course, but we can appreciate the poetry. We can appreciate the theology of it. He said, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. And that's so true, friends. You may be tempted to think that the God who saved you is frowning in heaven at you. That, but there's a smiling face behind it. There's love and love and more love. What is hard for us to bear is ultimately for our good. He works together all things for our good. And friends, as we think about ourselves here as a congregation, and as we seek to reach out to the lost, as we want to see the congregation grow here, as we want to establish a work in Wishaw as well, if the Lord will lead us in that way, can't we look and see that our Father in heaven loves us? He loves us. And he knows how to give good gifts to his children. And indeed he wants to give good gifts to, to his children. God has been so good to us here in Airdrie. Is that, is that not your experience? God has been so very good to us. We're celebrating this year our 200th anniversary of our first minister's ordination. Think about that. Think about how many generations of people 
have met for worship in this town. Think about all the prayers they've offered up to God in prayer meetings like we've had. Many, many things. Many, many burdens. And God has heard and answered prayers. And one answer of that prayer is that the fact that we're here today. Generations long ago prayed that God would keep this building open. That God would keep a witness here. That even maybe at times through declining numbers. That God would bless and pity us and shine his face on us. And what has God done? He has answered those prayers. And friends, we need to have that long view. God will answer prayers and God will bless. Hasn't God not been faithful here? Isn't it the case that God has saved people in this building? Is it not the case that through the preaching of the gospel from this pulpit, that lost sinners sitting in those pews have come to a knowledge of the truth and they've embraced Jesus Christ? God has done that. And will God not continue to do that? Will not God continue to give good gifts? Friends, I would encourage you as you pray. Perhaps you're thinking God's not answering these prayers we're praying. Ask yourself, am I asking amiss? Cherishing sin? Or not asking with intensity, knocking at the door of heaven? Or is my view of God amiss? In the sense that I'm not expecting good gifts from God. That I'm thinking of God as being a miser rather than a loving heavenly father. And friends, as we come later on to pray and as we pray in our homes and as we pray over these months about these things, expect your loving heavenly father to give good gifts to those who ask. And so plead with him. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you.